In this lecture, it's all about prokaryotic cells. We've talked about protein synthesis and gene regulation of eukaryotic cells. Now we're going to do the same thing for prokaryotic cells. And when you're done with this lecture, you need to be able to tell me differences in protein synthesis and gene expression of prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. So let's indicate that the steps of protein synthesis and gene regulation that we're going to talk about here is related to prokaryotic cells. So let's relate these processes to what we already know, protein synthesis and gene regulation of eukaryotic cells. And you can see that taking place here in this diagram. First, let's focus on similarities of the flow of information from DNA to RNA to protein. And again, that is called the central dogma. Both prokaryotes and eukaryotes show that same flow of information. It starts with DNA to RNA to a protein. Both prokaryotes and eukaryotes are going to utilize molecules like RNA polymerase to make messenger RNA. And they both have ribosomes where translation can occur. These similarities, again, suggest a common ancestor to all prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Now I want to look at differences in protein synthesis. And so let's look at these diagrams before I move down and we can fill in some of this information. So here we have a bacteria cell. And one thing to emphasize is there's no nucleus. So what can happen is, as the mRNA is being made, and we have mRNA right here, as it's being made in a bacteria cell, translation can start taking place immediately. So even before the mRNA is completely made, translation can already begin. Another difference you'll notice is that we have to process the mRNA in eukaryotic cells. We have to put on the guanine cap and the polyadenine tail, and we have to splice out the introns. There are no introns. to splice out in bacteria DNA. So mRNA processing does not have to occur in bacteria cells. So let's highlight some of those differences down here. In prokaryotes, both transcription and translation are happening in the cytoplasm. There's no nucleus. We said that there is no introns to splice out in bacteria cells. Transcription and translation can happen at the same time because the mRNA doesn't have to leave the nucleus. So as soon as the mRNA is made, ribosomes can attach on and translation can occur. Now, the next few pages are all about bacteria operons. The genes in prokaryotic cells are organized into um, segments that we call operons. You need to know operons well and how operons are regulated. Just like you need to know how eukaryotic cells can regulate their gene expression. So let me give you an idea of what an operon is. It says that prokaryotic genes are organized into operons. That basically means is you have many genes behind a single promoter. So here's the promoter, and you can see behind this promoter, there's one, two, three, there's four different genes coding for four different polypeptides. So whenever mRNA is made, so let's show transcription happening, and now we have an mRNA molecule. This one mRNA molecule can code for four different polypeptides. That is not the case in eukaryotic cells. We have one promoter. There is one gene behind that promoter. You're going to get one mRNA molecule, and that one mRNA molecule is only going to code for one polypeptide. Now, another difference that we're going to highlight on the next page is that when bacteria cells are regulating their genes, they're going to use repressors. That's similar to what we have. We have repressor molecules that will bind to silencer regions. But bacteria cells have a section of their DNA that is called the operator. Whereas you can see in eukaryotic cells, we have the TATA box that is found within the promoter. Bacteria cells have an operator. It is not considered part of the promoter. And we're going to see that some changes can happen to the operator that will either cause transcription of the genes or silencing of the genes. So let's dive into operons. 
Operons just refer to a section or unit of DNA in bacteria cells, in prokaryotic cells. You need to understand that eukaryotic cells do not have operons. So anytime you're reading a problem and it's talking about operons, you're talking about genes in a prokaryotic cell. Well, here we have an operon, and within an operon, you have some genes that are under control of a single promoter. Now, whether these genes are going to be expressed is going to be determined by molecules that are called repressors and others that are called inducers. Now, let's just take a look at this operon. Within an operon, you're going to have a promoter. This promoter operates just like the promoters in eukaryotic cells. We have a place where RNA polymerase, let's show that. RNA polymerase is going to bind to the promoter in this bacteria DNA and is going to transcribe the genes. Near the promoter, we have a sequence of bases that are termed the operator. You will see that certain molecules called repressors can bind to the operator. So I'm going to show a repressor. And I'm going to show that it can bind to the operator. And let's label that. If a repressor is bound to the operator, then RNA polymerase cannot transcribe the genes, and the genes are off or they're silenced. So repressors are proteins, and they interact with the operator. Within the operon, we have the structural genes. So we're just talking about coding regions of DNA that are coding for proteins. And then outside of the operon, so this isn't a part of the operon, we have genes that are known as these regulatory genes. It is the regulatory genes that are going to produce these proteins that are the repressors. So let me show you that down here. If this gene, a regulatory gene, is transcribed into mRNA, and then that mRNA is translated into a protein, a repressor protein, then we now have a protein that can bind to the operator and can shut off transcription. So this repressor, or this regulatory protein, binds to the operator, preventing RNA polymerase from binding to the promoter and transcribing the genes. Something to note about these repressors that are made. Some of them are made and they're active. Some of them are made and they're inactive. And because there's different types of repressors, you need to have memorized two different types of operons. So I'm gonna take you through the trip operon and the last operon. And then in class, you're going to build models and you're going to be explaining both of them to me. So the genes in the trip operon, they are going to code for enzymes that produce an amino acid called tryptophan. So bacteria cells can synthesize their own amino acids that they need to make their own proteins. So since tryptophan is needed all the time by the cell, you need to know that the tryptophan genes of this operon are normally on. That means that they're continuously transcribed. The cell's making the enzymes that can produce the tryptophan. But when the cell has plenty of tryptophan and it doesn't need to make any more, then it needs to be able to shut off these genes. So we say that the trip operon is a repressible operon. That means it's normally on, but we can repress it. We can shut it off. The LAC operon is opposite. It contains LAC genes that are normally not being transcribed. So those genes are normally off or they're silenced. Now, these LAC genes code for an enzyme. That enzyme is lactase. And lactase can go and break up lactose. Now, lactose is a food source for bacteria. And if they have this food source, then they need to make the enzyme to digest the lactose so they can get energy from it. But if they do not have lactose, then they do not need to make this lactase enzyme. So the genes that code for lactase are normally off unless 
the bacteria cell has found some lactose and then those genes that code for lactase are going to be turned on. So we say that the lac operon is an inducible operon. It's normally off, but it can be induced or it can be turned on. First, the trip operon. Here's a situation where this regulatory gene is coding for a repressor, but the repressor is inactive. So RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter. There's nothing blocking it at the operator, and we're getting transcription of these genes. And then we're getting the production of these enzymes that can make tryptophan. But remember I said the trip operon is a repressible operon. We can shut it off. So you need to know how these genes or how this operon is shut off. So that's what these diagrams are attempting to show you. So we have the trip operon here, and we can see that those genes are being expressed. The genes are turned on. The repressor is inactive. But watch what happens as the cell continues to produce tryptophan. Levels of tryptophan are going to increase. So I'm going to draw some tryptophan molecules in here because the cell is synthesizing them with these enzymes that are being made. And when levels become really high, then tryptophan binds to this inactive repressor. And now the repressor is active. When the repressor is active, it's going to bind to the operator. So let's label that. So now there's a protein on the operator, and RNA polymerase is blocked. So that means no more transcription making those enzymes that can produce tryptophan. So the tryptophan genes are shut off. But remember, tryptophan is an amino acid that is used in proteins, and bacteria cells are making proteins all the time. So eventually, the tryptophan is all used up. Even this tryptophan right here is going to get used, so it's no longer attached to the repressor. So that means the repressor is going to change back into its inactive form, and it cannot bind to the operator. So that leads to RNA polymerase being able to transcribe those genes coding for the enzymes to produce more tryptophan. So again, to highlight some ideas about the trip operon is that it is repressible. It's normally on, but it can be shut off. That regulatory protein or that repressor is made inactive. It's only going to become active whenever tryptophan binds to that repressor. When it's active, the repressor can bind to the operator and it's going to shut down the production of tryptophan. We can then turn back on the expression of these genes though. When all the tryptophan is used up, then we see that our repressor can no longer bind to the operator and we can get transcription of the genes again. And now on to the specifics of the LAC operon. So it's an inducible operon. That means that it's normally off, but it can be induced, or the expression of these genes can be induced. Remember that the LAC apron contains genes that will code for mRNA, which can be translated given us lactase. But a bacteria cell does not need to make lactase unless it is in the presence of lactose, and it needs to break down the lactose and use it for energy. Another idea to understand, which is different from the trip operon, is that the regulatory gene codes for repressor, but this repressor is automatically active. It is made active. And as soon as it's made, it binds to the operator and it's blocking transcription or expression of these genes. So this setup is occurring in a cell that does not have lactose. But now let's see what happens to turn on the LAC operon. To turn on the LAC operon, the cell has to take in lactose. Lactose is called the inducer. Here we have lactose, and you can see that lactose right here is present and it binds to the repressor. When it does that, it inactivates the repressor. So that repressor cannot bind to the operator. So transcription can now occur and that's going to lead to the production of mRNA 
that codes for the production of lactase. So now lactase is going to be produced. Now that we have lactase being made in the cell, let me show you what's going to happen. Here I've added lactase. It was produced by the cell. Lactase is going to come along and it's going to break down lactose. So we see it digesting the lactose. And it's even going to digest this lactose that is making that repressor inactive. So once this lactose has been removed, now our repressor is back to its active form. It's going to bind to the operator and it's going to shut off the transcription of these genes. Because if you think about it, if all the lactose is gone, then the cell does not need to make lactose to digest it. Now you might think that's confusing, but you will understand this much better after you build the models. But what I think is even more confusing is the fact that operons show what we call negative feedback. And we also say that operons show what's called negative controls and positive controls. So I'm going to try to explain the difference between those. We've already talked about negative feedback before, and I probably have shown you this diagram. Whenever the end product of a pathway feeds back, that's what this arrow is attempting to show you, is this product feeds back and stops one of the initial processes in this biochemical pathway, then we say that negative feedback is occurring. And I'm going to go back in the notes here because I believe I did not fill in this blank. So back to that tryptophan or that trip operon. Because the end result, remember the end result was making tryptophan. Because tryptophan can feed back and shut down steps earlier in the process of the making of tryptophan, then we say that this operon is showing negative feedback. So lots of times if you have operon questions, it's going to be related to negative feedback. This graph is showing you changes in tryptophan levels over time in a cell. And the shape of this graph um, is a classic example of a process where negative feedback is occurring. We can see that we have high levels of tryptophan here at A. So the tryptophan will feed back and it's going to stop the transcription of those tryptophan genes. So transcription of the tryptophan genes at this time are shut off due to negative feedback. So then we see that tryptophan levels fall. So let's indicate that trip operon is off during this time. And tryptophan is being used up by the cell. When we get to this point in time at C, there is no tryptophan to bind to those repressor proteins. So the repressor becomes inactive and transcription of those trip genes begins. So we get those enzymes that can synthesize tryptophan and tryptophan levels increase in the cell. So that was negative feedback and how it can be used to shut off processes or regulate processes. When we're talking about negative controls and positive controls, we're just talking about processes that stop the transcription of genes or processes that promote the transcription of genes. Anytime we see a process and it's stopping the gene expression or it's stopping transcription, then we say that's a form of negative control. So when an active repressor binds to the operator, shutting off those genes, that's an example of a negative control. Any process that occurs, and that's going to allow for the transcription of genes, then we call that a positive control. So when an inducer binds to a repressor, makes it inactive, so then transcription can take place, that's an example of a positive control. So take a look at this diagram and see if you can determine whether I'm showing you a negative control or a positive control. It's fairly easy to determine that since transcription is taking place, that I'm showing you an example of a positive control. You just need to be able to look at this diagram and explain what's going on. So we have the inducer that's binding to this repressor 
making it inactive, it can't bind to the operator, so transcription can take place.